Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the last day for the last panel on day one of the Vision Zero Cities pop-up conference. We have a really exciting panel on the topic of quick builds. Because quick build street projects are semi-permanent, are designed and constructed quickly, and are more cost effective, they will play an outsized role in the coming years with cities wanting to take advantage of the huge increases in sustainable modes while also contending with flash budgets. Today, I am joined by three experts in the field. Dr. Will Norman is London's Walking and Cycling Commissioner. Vignesh Swaminathan is the CEO of Crossroad Lab. And Jenny O'Connell is the Program Manager at NACTO. And my name is Philip Mietkowski. I'm Transportation Alternatives Director of Research, but today I'm this panel's moderator. This panel will follow the same format as the previous two panels. We'll start with three panelists, each individually presenting on their subtopic, followed by a discussion where we'll take questions from you, the audience. So please type out your questions during the presentation in the chat, and we'll be sure to answer as many as we can. Our first presentation is by Dr. Will Norman, who has recently overseen the implementation of 100 kilometers of bike lanes in the last year as London's first walking and cycling commissioner. He has experience working with nonprofits, governments, UN agencies, and European institutions, especially on the topic of active transportation. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Will Norman. Thank you very much, Philip. And uh, thank you everybody for, for, for taking part and uh, coming to hear, hear our, this, this great panel. I'm just gonna uh, say, share some slides. Uh, so my name is Will Norman. I'm the Mayor of London's Walking and Cycling Commissioner. My job is pretty self-explanatory. My job is to get more people walking and cycling. Um, we have, like New York, like other cities around the world, adopted a Vision Zero approach. Sadly, over 4,000 people a year are killed or seriously injured on our roads. And uh, we've set a target to eliminate uh, that by 2040. Uh, 2041. There are four key, uh, there are four key, um, key pillars to, to that strategy, safer speed, safer vehicles, safer behaviours and, and safer streets. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about those and, and how we've rolled things out rapidly over the past year. The speeds, I think, as everybody knows, is a factor in, in most collisions, critical to making our streets safer. If our streets are safer, more people feel enabled to walk and cycle. Uh, we have about, I think, about 50% of our streets now in London are 20 mile an hour zones, safer for, for kids to get to school, people to get around to their shops. Again, over the past year, we've taken an example of rolling these out using a signs and lines approach first, rather than building it. So you put in the signs, you put in the lines, you monitor what's happening, and after that, you can come back and fill in with infrastructure as and when it's needed. The second pillar is all about safer vehicles, and I'm particularly proud of this. We've, this is not a quick build piece, but it is a lasting piece of change that we will be de we're delivering. We've just launched the world's first direct vision standard, making our trucks safer. As of Monday, you will get fined £500, $700, every day you come into London with one of these dangerous trucks where you can't see the pedestrians and cyclists around them. So that's a really uh, amazing project to make our, our, our street, our, our vehicles safer. Making our behaviors safer is all about working with the police and enforcing. And this is a wonderful project that we've been doing called Community Road Watch. You go out with a bunch of kids outside their school and you teach them to use the speed guns. They stop the speeders, uh, they, they point out who's speeding, the police flag them down and the kids get involved. The whole community gets involved in reducing speed in a local area. This girl with the unicorn mask, when I went out with her, stopped an SUV doing about 25 miles an hour in a 20 zone. It sped off and the police chased it for 20 minutes through, uh, throughout London. And when they stopped the car, they found guns and drugs in the, in the back. Uh, so it just goes to show if you police road crime, you can also police all sorts of other crime too. But what I really want to talk to you about today is all about our quick build on how we've made our streets safer. Um, and this has not been something that's new in London. We have over the past, this is built into the very heart of our transport strategy. The mayor has set an objective of shifting the, num the percentage of journeys from walking and cycling and public transport from 63% to 80%. 
So for the past four years, I've been busy building cycle lanes all over the city. Many of them like this, with concrete, with curbs, with beautiful new drainage, all looking fantastic. Um, and, and that was working very successfully. We saw the highest increase in cycling on record. But then obviously last year, COVID hit and, and everything changed. London went into lockdown. Uh, our shops, our restaurants, our pubs, our bars, our offices all closed. And as a consequence, the traffic levels dropped. And what we found was that as the traffic dropped, people started using the streets for walking, for cycling, and enjoying that space that had previously, this is just out the back of Buckingham Palace. It's a busy, busy road on most of the days. Here you've got a family going for a bike ride. The second thing that happened was people stopped using public transit. So the tube was empty, 5% of its previous capacity. So that's millions of journeys that weren't being made by public transport. As we came out of that lockdown, we were really worried that mil those millions of journeys would end up being made by car instead, which would lead, lead, lead to, in a city like London, gridlock, um, and not to mention an air pollution crisis, which is the very last thing anyone needs in the middle of a, a, of a respiratory disease pandemic. So what we did was roll out a very rapid program of reallocation of road space to make the streets safer and, uh, and, and uh, safer for people to walk and cycle, to choose those cleaner, greener forms of transport, the most efficient forms of transport for a city, but also to allow social distancing. So this is an example of some of the 22,000 square meters of new pavement footways that we rolled out. This was done overnight in this situation. We took a carriageway off the, off the, off the roadway. We put in rubber curbs, we infilled it with asphalt, all done overnight, creating a much wider space outside local shops. And this is a busy transport hub where people come out of the, the underground system, out of the Metro and also onto buses. Uh, elsewhere in the city, high streets needed the space for people to safely access the shops. This is a local high street near where I live that was transformed by closing it to traffic. You could still unload and, and make deliveries, but it created a, a safe space for people to, uh, to, to walk and cycle and, and use the shops in that space. And we have over 100, 181 different high streets that now look, look like this. In addition to making space for the pedestrians, you know, we needed to make space for the cyclists. If we were get, getting to, you know, people were going to switch their journeys from public transport or cars into greener space, we needed uh, public uh, space for, for, for cycleways. This is Park Lane in central London, usually a four lane motorway, 40 miles an hour. It now had a, a safe cycle tracks using bollards, water filled bollards put down the side again overnight to put in the space. And then the next night we came back and did some of the signs and lines to make that work. In other locations, we used wands to make it safer. And as Philip said, we delivered in, in less than 12 months, over 100 kilometers of new bike lanes uh, across the city. And the outcome of this is we've seen a huge increase in cycling. Last weekend, we had a 200% increase in the, number of people, in the number of people cycling. In some parts of London, that went up to 300%. In parts of London that I saw for this weekend, just the weekend just passed was up to 400% increase. The bike shops are running out of bikes. It's proving to be so popular. But it's not just about the cycle lanes. We've also used this rapid build temporary measures to put in uh, what we're calling low traffic neighborhoods. These are using planters like these things, uh, you know, just big plant pots made out of wood and closing, uh, restricting traffic that can move through these areas uh, so that people can still get access to the houses. They can still get deliveries. You can still get emergency vehicles through, but it stops the cu uh, traffic cutting through. And again, we've seen results out of this. In one, in one area today, I saw data that showed that there'd been a 31% fall in traffic, a 50% increase in cycling in these areas. That not, is not only just good news for our health and well-being and, and the general pleasantness of the area. It's also great for reducing air quality and improving, uh, you know, and, and reducing road danger. One of the new schemes that we've been rolling out in London is using temporary, you know, timed closures of roads. And this is our school streets program. We now have 300 schools across the capital. Actually, it's growing. I think I can't keep track. There's so many of them but it's closing off the streets at drop off and pick off time. This, this reduces the number of parents who drive their kids to school. It increases the number of kids who are walking, cycling and scooting. It also, again, cleans up the air around the schools, making it safe, uh, safe uh, as well. 
like New York, we've been introducing some of the streeteries where we turn our streets into space for restaurants so people could eat. That was particularly popular in the summer. In the British winter, it's not so popular and we've got lots of them, but I expect there'll be a big, uh, big return uh, for those. So overall, in the past 12 months, we've delivered, actually, in, one of my colleagues said we delivered what we'd previously been delivering in five years in five months. Um, and that's all credit to the skills of the teams that were delivering that across the book. But I, I maintain we couldn't do this from a standing start. It'd be a bit like going to the Olympics and suddenly rocking up at the Olympics, having never done anything and launching yourself against Usain Bolt in the 100 meters. Our teams, our politicians, our communities across London had been doing this for a while. And when the crisis came, we were able to deliver at, at massive speed. This is my boss getting his vaccination. London is looking better. We're getting a massive rollout of vaccinations. And so there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I think it's time for us to all reflect on what's happened in the past 12 months to think what we can learn for, for going forward. Certainly the pace and scale of what we were delivering in London last year was absolutely, you know, it, it meant that we did not get everything perfect perfect throughout the whole system. We've had, this was not without controversy. We've had vandalism, we have people putting tax down in the street, we've had legal uh, challenges, we've had protests. But interestingly, for every survey and every poll we do, the majority of people want these measures, they want them to stay and they want more of them. And I think it's a lesson to all of us that we shouldn't be listening to those who shout loudest. We should make an effort to try and listen to everybody. But that's saying that we don't listen to, we do need to listen to everybody and we do need to listen to feedback. And I think one of the things that I take away from this is the importance of engaging communities uh, and, uh, and consulting. I've also learned it's amazing what you can do with temporary materials. The simple magic wand, putting that in can make this, you know, those simple tubes, plastic tubes can make it safe and feel safe for people to cycle. But you can't do everything in temporary measures. There are some things in London which we couldn't do. Big complex junctions, uh, some of the signals that required new, new technologies, new things going in. Then moving forward, I want to adopt an approach of temporary plus. We can use temporary materials where it works and, and, and uh, in other places, uh, but in some places we do need to use the permanent materials and we can't do it all in the, with the quick design, quick wins. Moving forward, we know that the existing challenges are still there. We still have an obesity crisis. We still have an inactivity crisis. We still have the congestion problems and air quality and we have climate change, which is you know, ever more of a, of a danger. And we're seeing that all over the, all over the world. Coupled with that, we've got an, an economic crisis coming and less money to spend it on. So there's more urgency to deliver this. There's more urgency to deliver more of it, but there will be less money to go around. I'm confident that our approach of making our streets healthy is absolutely spot on. And I know for a fact that in the last year, we've proved that we can use quick design quick build to deliver this in, a, in, in, in an amazing hurry, uh, in an amazing speed and have some fantastic results for the city. Somebody was asking me the other day what my three magic ingredients were, and I'm going to finish now just by talking about the three magic ingredients that I think are necessary to bring about a transformation at scale and at pace, but a lasting transformation, not something that will fade away and be removed. You need the political leadership. Here in London, with the Mayor of London, we have that political leadership. You also need the skills of the designers, the engineers, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the officers who are delivering and, and making the changes to the street. And again, I go back to my analogy that you can't just sort of rock up at the Olympics without having any practice on this. But I think most importantly, you need communities campaigning for these changes, which is why organizations such as Transport Alternatives, Transportation Alternatives, are so important, mobilizing communities, mobilizing people, calling for, for, for these changes from the politicians, because it's only with those voices can you get the lasting changes moving forward. Um, thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to taking some questions afterwards. Wow, well, that's really impressive. Dr. Norman, I know that many of us uh, on this side of the pond are looking at <laughs> London with lots of envy. Um, you have been doing amazing work and um, we're, we're definitely watching and learning and that was really interesting. Um, thanks for saying that. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, um, please feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout the presentations and we'll try to reach as many as we can later on the program. Uh, next up, we have Vignesh Swaminathan. Vignesh is the CEO of Crossroad Lab. 
Vignift has been in engineering in the active transportation space for over a decade and has experience in planning, design, operations, and construction. He and his company are passionate about making communities accessible through good design, especially with quick builds. Vignesh. Hello, hello all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Phil, for this opportunity to present to you all uh, what we've been doing and what we've been innovating with for the last few years. Um, my name is Vignesh Swaminathan. I'm the CEO and president of Crossroad Lab, and we've been messing around in the quick build space for the last three years. We started Crossroad Lab three years ago, um, and we've done temporary quick build and semi-permanent type of facilities. Um, so um, Crossroad Lab, uh, we do a community outreach, engineering design. We're a civil engineering firm. We're not necessarily an urban planning firm. So we, we're kind of the bad guys. We do the final PA plan specs and estimates. We do the detailing. We tell people what works, what doesn't work. And we, we, we end up compromising the facilities when they, when they need to uh, be, be compromised. Um, we've worked on temporary pilot that you see in Mountain View, California. We've done, we did San Jose's entire quick build network, which is 60 miles of roadway that was implemented in 10 months with 58 protected corners. Um, we've worked on uh, helping NACTO uh, review and, and do some of the diagrams and, and wording uh, in the don't give up at the intersection guidance that used a lot of the research from our project here. And we've worked on um, more residential, uh, quick, more residential protected bike lane projects, protected bike lane through a residential neighborhood, which is quite complex. Um, my experience is I've worked in downtown operations and traffic control. I work for a highway consulting firm doing interchange design. Um, I'm CEO of Crossroad Lab, and I also am Sustainability Commission Chair for the City of Cupertino. I'm also on VTA Citizen Advisory Committee, Citizen Watchdog Committee as their chair. And I also sit on Greenway's board, uh, Greenway.org's board, board member. Um, I'm gonna start with the basics here as to why we talk about quick build. And it's kind of because we deal with water. We're all water-based human beings and we've de been dealing with how do we manipulate water in and around our infrastructure forever. Um, whether it is from roadway to, uh, roadway, uh, to uh, de designing the first curb and gutter was built in the Indus Valley of civilization in 2600 BC. And we've evolved curb and gutter over the years to deal with and manipulate drainage throughout our history. Um, we've, uh, uh, oops, let's do this slide. Um, so um, now as we, as we grow and we build out our built environment, we still are dealing with the water. We have a lot of native uh, folks who have, who have been living along the water, along rivers. And as we've implemented farming, agriculture, highways, we've manipulated the water to, uh, 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 to not flow as it used to. Um, we still now are trying to get back to our roots with keeping clean storm waters, start streets clean using uh, um, C3 or bioswales. We try to have natural riparian corridors and bike trails, but we, we're dealing with water all the time. And water triggers a lot of environmental, uh, uh, environmental issues. Um, uh, so why, are we, why, do we, why am I talking about this? Is because we're eventually trying to, we want to deal with the water again. We eventually want to deal with full civil capital improvement projects where we're redoing the curb and gutter, putting in biosphills and et cetera, but that's a lot of impact. All of you all know the amount of political impact, community impact, environmental impact of putting in a raised protected bikeway down is crazy, you know, signals, everything. So we have to go through an educational effort to get people on board with these type of facilities before we actually go and implement it and manipulate the water. And the ways of us doing it are doing some sort of demonstration project, going and doing a pilot project uh, 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 to test out for a few weeks, collecting data and eventually getting to raise bikeways. Or what this is, this is just a doweled in curb. So it didn't trigger environmental. So we didn't move the curb and gutter. This has slots in it. So this is kind of our way of getting away from CEQA and NEPA. Um, I'm in California, so we deal with CEQA here, which is much more uh, restrictive than NEPA, and so it really holds back a lot of projects. Um, why, why, is, why do I mean by hold back? Is because we changing our project delivery system. You know, typically we do stuff in a design bid build, and it's a blame game. You know, I as a designer will I'm supposed to do the best Cadillac type of facilities with not thinking about cost in my own bubble. I give it to city to go bid out, and they have to go bid it out and try to get the cheapest price. And the contractor tries to get the cheapest price. And the city is always bugging me like, hey, why do you make it so expensive? And I'm like, I'm trying to do my best job. The city is asking the contractor, why are you charging us so much? The contractor is blaming me. I'm like, why are you doing all this fancy stuff? And it's just a blame game. And there's no ownership of it. Do I own the roads? No. Does the contractor own the roads? No. Does the city have ownership of the road? No. They're not actually being involved. And so we have a new process called design build, which is how we deal with buildings. Um, that's where a building owner owns the building. They care about every single facility, the maintenance, the operations, if a window breaks, they care about all that. And they want to have it all be done by one consultant, one group. And so what happens in design building, this is very typical for the private sector. It's 
totally new for the public sector, is that is that they hire one designer contractor who goes and does a design and they work with the architects and the architects work with the contractor and figure out what's what where things should go and cost and they it, it work, that's the way they get through the process instead of doing design bid build. The issue with this is that the designer can cut corners. I can call up my contractor buddy and be like, hey, you got extra aggregate, you got extra posts, you got extra whatever cool, you don't have that, okay, I'll design around that. And I can cut corners with design. Now, this is very contradictory to how public, public sector works, but this is what we need to get to for quick build design because we're cutting corners. I'm using cheaper materials. I'm using plastic posts. I'm using, I'm using paint. I'm using uh, potted plants. I'm doing, I'm cutting costs. I'm not doing curb and gutter. And so we need to have this communication at a different level with the city maintenance crews, contractors, and everybody about the maintenance operations and re and implementation of these facilities if they break in the future. And what do I mean when I talk about education? This stuff is so new. We deal, we deal with bike lanes a certain way for a long time. Um, in America, we always uh, we weave our uh, bicycle and vehicle have to weave when they navigate the street. But the, what that you see on the top and on the bottom here is what we see from our best practices of our time right now is that if a bicycle wants to go straight, they have to weave across the vehicle lane. Um, we have green bike lanes. We don't do green bike lanes at this anymore. We do dash, we've learned. Um, and we try to encourage folks to do two stage turn box turns because we want folks to cross more like a pedestrian. Why is because we do we want bicycles and vehicles to weave like so, or do we want them to cross like so? And we need to educate folks through uh, implementation of these facilities. I can give these presentations all day. I can make YouTube videos about this stuff, right? But in, in, it, it needs to be in the ground in the folks community for them to understand how to interact with these facilities. What is the big change that we're talking about is we're talking about how this conflict is dealt with. How does a vehicle and a bike cross each other? And how does the bicycle make a left turn? We're dealing with these two educational elements for both the vehicle, but knowing how to be aware for cyclists and knowing about for a cyclist to be uh, ready for, um, uh, to, for cyclists to know how to make a left turn. And so how do we communicate this to the community and through engineering, right? Um, so engineers, we think about plans, specs, and estimate. We have our plans, we have the specs telling us what material goes where, we have the estimate about how much it's gonna cost. These are just fancy words for exhibit, memo, and cost. And so anybody, an activist, community uh, leader, city staff can put together an exhibit memo and cost and communicate to engineers at this scale. And we eventually we can get to facilities that look like this. This is an engineering plan for what we did in San Jose. Um, a lot of detail, a lot of information in here. And this is how we like we typically work in our firm. We work in 10%. We don't work like how um, other firms do. A lot of other firms, they do, uh, they do big exhibits like this. They hide all the problems. There's utilities, there's planting, there's curbs, there's signals, there's trees, there's stuff. And they hid everything when they do these exhibits. So these things are a joke. I hate these. I hate when people put stuff like this together. There, you know, because it's just lying to the public, it's lying to the city, it's lying to the community that things can be feasible. Um, but we, we're doing stuff like this is where we need to get to when we talk about quick build. Um, instead of showing pie in the sky images, we show stuff that is actually fit within our facilities, showing the issues, setting back stop bars, instead of convincing the community about stuff that doesn't is not actually uh, functionally uh, ready. Um, and so doing exhibits like this, this is nice and symmetrical, but they're not always symmetrical. Here's an example of downtown San Jose. Um, I got a one-way street going northbound on the left here. I got another one-way street going southbound on the right here. And I have a, 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 a east-west road that ends at a dead end at the university right here. So I have every single type of bicycle facility in a NACTO handbook and their second cousin in this one, these two intersections. Um, and that's because this, it's needed here to get folks to navigate to the school, if folks need to navigate up and down, if folks need to use, have a two uh, facilities on both sides of the one-way street, the facilities on one side of the one-way street, if I need to get folks to merge over from the bike lane to make left, to be on the left side, to go straight to university to avoid conflicts. And so I'm dealing with all these changes. And so doing these changes with curb and gutter and parking removal, you're gonna have a political nightmare. You're gonna have the mayor involved, your community is gonna be involved, everyone's gonna come out and they're gonna hate the project. Do we gonna paint and post? Yeah, people still hate the project, but we're able to make changes and adjustments to it on the fly. So we painted some things with water-based paint, knowing they're gonna be controversial. We moved around parking, knowing it's gonna be controversial, right? We adjusted different things with, with different types of material. Well, we said that this is just gonna be glued down. We're gonna test it. We work with the community and the businesses saying, hey, what do you think about this for a month? And if they didn't like it, we made adjustments. And the small adjustments we made at different parts of this massive 60 mile network gave us the political will and the agreement by the community for the entire project. I don't have that shown here, but we had a slip lane 
a right turn slip lane next to a pork chop Chiang Rising island that was really, really, really tight um, and at a high volume. What we did is we we shut down that slip lane temporarily to tell people this is what we we're trying to do. The community got angry about the slip lane and we took it back and we gave them back the slip lane and then they agreed with the rest of the project. We we're like, cool, thank you for that slip lane back. And we that's how we got these political uh, will um, uh, to get to where we needed to go to be. Now, this is all change. We're in COVID. What can we do during COVID? What we can do is we can do the basics that engineers get triggered by. Engineers get triggered by turning radii, lane width. I know, I'm an engineer, I get triggered by that kind of stuff. And so if we can, if we can, can work right now on dealing with lane widths and tighten radius right now, during COVID, when we're talking about dining, walking streets, wider sidewalks, social distancing, then we can eventually get to something that's a little bit more temporary, uh, it's more quick build, and eventually get into a protected bike park. Um, now, we've had a lot of success in the last three years. We've built, we've built around 25 miles of roadway, you know, around 74 protected corners uh, in our three, four years. Um, a lot of art crosswalks, a lot of protected, a, a, lot, a lot of different types of uh, 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 intersections here. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, um, success you can get with just paint and plastic. And it doesn't be done by curb and gutter. And this is very controversial to how cities operate because the city manners, they look at their billing, they know how much they're buying, they know what their city staff is working on, they understand and this is a total flip to how uh, things are done um, with the city. Um, I see a slide here that's supposed, supposed to be in this order, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, we can go over this real quick. I'm going to skip ahead, this slide wasn't supposed to be here. So we have, uh, we have a few different guidances right now that, that help us um, get to where we need to be um, that, that you all can refer to. Um, the best one is that I found that we have so far in California is DIB 89. Um, okay, is DIB 89, DIB 89 has this diagram. Um, DIB is our design bulletin for a highway design manual in California. And so it's this diagram of what is a protected bike lane. It has probably the most straight, this one diagram tells me more information than the federal separated bike guide, than the Massachusetts guide. This is one diagram just very, very clear. I went through all these the diagrams and this is just very clear about what is a protected bike lane, what defines it. Now the rest of this document is not having much information. They have a protected bike lane, protected intersection diagram in here that we're supposed to use that looks like it was made in Microsoft Word. And so there's not really like a lot of information here, but this diagram tells us a lot about what we, uh, how to implement these facilities. If you're looking for policy about how to do these things through temporary roadway facilities, you can use the uh, uh, federal, has the uh, how to do stuff for resurfacing projects and NACTO and us have worked together on this don't go to the intersection guide. It's very, very thorough and closes a lot of the gaps between these other uh, guidances. Um, the Massachusetts guides talks a lot about heavy civil improvements, but it doesn't talk about quick build and a lot of stuff is very, very expensive, but it eventually can lead to something like this. And you don't need to do the full swale like here, you can just do a little bit of concrete at the beginning and ends and the corner in here, if you're following this guidance and just do some posts in between. And then you can get as much bang for your buck here. And then eventually when you deal with funding and more, you can deal with the cross sections that we love to talk about. But in my opinion, dealing with the intersections first is how you get the political will for the cross sections. Um, now, how is the NACTO guidance useful? It shows, it shows, has diagrams like this that talk about how vehicles and bikes are supposed to cross. And here's a project that we did in San Jose where you put, you put a, roadway bots dots or raised pavement markers in the ground that so the vehicle feels that before they cross over the bicycle facility to deal with that conflict. Um, now, some folks ask me how do cities do these kind of projects and how do cities purchase these materials? So city, these materials can be purchased from many different departments. They can be purchased directly by the city manager, this is the city of Cupertino. And I would point out that we are in a strong council state in California, so I don't deal with strong mayor. Uh, uh, strong mayor um, cities, um, uh, strong mayor cities, you don't have a city manager, so you don't have a technical staff that holds things true. You still do, you have a lot more politics, but in California, we have a city manager. And so um, things can be bought by the city manager. They can be bought by sustainability programs. Capital improvement projects can buy extra and keep it uh, uh, on the side for any kind of repairs and et cetera. Transportation um, does, uh, does the stuff for their operations. So they can purchase stuff for that are ongoing rolling for operations, operations meeting paving. Streets development services, you can get a developer to buy stuff for you and for you to keep it in, in, in the house. And environmental programs can convince the folks for trash pickup and operations to purchase their different materials um, for dumpsters and stuff like that that um, we did in San Jose. 
Um, other ways of getting funding for this is we do stormwater fee in Cupertino and San Jose. This is a secret trick that cities use is we put, instead of doing taxes or uh, grants, we do a fee on our homeowners uh, that keep the streets clean. And this is actually a secret for quick build. So basically we convince everybody to pay for keeping the streets clean, street sweeping, improving swales. And we use this to help implement swales, quick build and, uh, and doing these type of uh, roadway facilities. And this is like a secret sauce that we use. Now, what do we wanna do with this? We wanna enable community leaders to be able to talk in exhibits, memo and costs. We want them and city staff to be able to communicate to their leaders about what these kind of projects are. Um, and, in, in, and that's how you have uh, a signature, that's, how, that's what we wanna do. Now this is done typically when we do signature projects, big capital improvement projects. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about things where the city staff is actually enabled by the community leaders and they all collaborate to do an ongoing process of, of these kind of facilities. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here because for the, for the sake of time, um, uh, but we've seen uh, these kind of facilities done in many different ways. Um, this one was done by the, PT, the, the PTA in Fremont, has worked with the city of Fremont on doing crosswalks in their community. This is done in Oakland, um, a painting that art crosswalk. I would point out there are issues that come with doing these kind of projects that have to do with water. Oakland is a historic red line community that does not have drainage. If you know about most red line communities, they were built in marshy areas where they did not were built with proper drainage. And Oakland is a definition of a street city that does not have street sweeping, does not have drainage, and it floods. And so doing quick build in this low income Af low income community uh, and doing uh, quick build with paint and post is fake. You know, you're lying to the community and hiding the actual problems, the equity problems that have historically been there. And so I would not recommend doing quick build projects in communities when you actually have drainage issues. So in Oakland right now, this is filled with trash and there's a, there's a, it's flooded and there's debris and there's nobody maintaining it. And so you need to make sure you have a proper maintenance plan before you do a fun art project like this. They can be fun, but we need to make sure that we actually do our due diligence. Um, I'm gonna go over quickly about different materials. We use this is one that engineers, this is the raised paper, this is a, a Dura curb. It's got a little bit of a bump and the post. Engineers love this because they use this on freeways. Fire departments love this because this one folds flat and they don't have to damage their vehicles. This is great for holding up dumpsters and doing uh, uh, and adjusting the roadway typically, but make sure that you do this at the proper angle and read the spec. Many cities don't follow the rules of this one and then they end up having issues with this. These are really quick and easy. This is a little ceramic bot dot. It's bulky and it's, it works really well. You can do a lot with these type of facilities. Uh, the type of units, you'd rather do it's a roundabout or a little curve extension. These are really, really nice to work with. And we use this in San Jose and the Bay Area to help prevent sideshow activity. We have a lot of folks that at night do donuts in the streets and they, they go from intersection to intersection and then they just do donuts. And this is really useful to help prevent uh, and restrict some of that activity that happens at late night. Um, there's also temporary tape, water-filled barriers and different types of paint and bot stocks that we use. Um, if you do use concrete, um, make sure it's low curb and uh, is mountable because you're gonna have to deal with your fire department and you have to work with your fire department heavily. Um, if you do any kind of dowel curbs or anything like that, your fire departments can hold up your project. They can, they can totally restrict, they can go talk to the mayors, everything is a major uh, 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 pain. Um, not, but working with them and getting them to agree with these kind of projects is, is probably one of the first steps to do before they uh, come back later. Uh, these things can happen quickly. Um, I'm gonna show you one last example here of uh, a project that we did in one month. So the, this was done for uh, Facebook was building a new building on the other side of the street and the city of Fremont needed to build a crosswalk for their employees. And in one month, from where is the crosswalk gonna go to construction? We built this crosswalk with paint, plastic, and we used a rapid flashing beacon that was solar powered. The city tried to hold the project back by saying that we need to do a full lighting study, environmental again. They said we need to do a full lighting study for the corridor. And then I said, we can use this solar powered beacon that can illuminate the crosswalk and illuminate the curb ramp. Uh, and that doesn't need to be hardwired or anything. We don't have to trigger any environmental. And so we were able to buy this unit and implement this. And so this is also part of quick build, is doing stuff that does not trigger environmental, such as lighting and drainage and et cetera. So solar powered units by uh, uh, rapid flashing beacon, electrical units are also part of quick build because you're not triggering a big capital improvement projects or environmental. And so this is what it looked like. It was just a quick, quick and dirty crosswalk, but it got in in one month. It looks nice at night. It's bright. It illuminates across uh, the sidewalk. But this is, this is a, a lot of cities would be like, oh, a crosswalk? No, we can't do this. Let's try to hide the conversation. And no, you don't need to do that. This is this can be done in one month. You know, this happened in January of 2020, um, and it, it just it's it's very well utilized and it's very intuitive and it's expected on this roadway. 
And so I'll close with this slide is what we need to be getting to is we need to get to be getting, getting to communicating exhibit memo cost directly, having the city staff and the community leaders work well uh, together to have an ongoing project system, not signature projects, not capital improvement projects. If you're going to do quick as a capital improvement projects, it's going to be a waste of money, a huge process, and you're going to just rally up the whole community without actually delivering a capital improvement project. Instead, do it part of your operations team as an ongoing effort so your city staff learns and is enabled and you're not really relying on consultants and construction companies to do your do with the city's, uh, the city's work. Um, so with that, I'll answer any if you have questions at the end and I'll pass it on to uh, Jenny from, uh, uh, from NACTO. Ganesh, thank you um, so much for that. It's, um, I think it's really important to have that technical side whenever we're discussing road infrastructure. Um, I know that I personally love seeing all the different types of bollards and bumps um, that we never see here in New York. So thank you for that. Uh, next, we have Denny O'Connell, who is a program manager at NACTO. And he has years of experience working on active transportation projects with federal, state, and local governments. She has worked worked extensively with city governments across North America and their DOTs on active transportation projects in the context of funding, public health, and environmental planning. As program manager at NACTO, she has worked on many different types of quick build projects from coast to coast. So without further ado, Jenny. Hi. Thank you so much, Philip, um, and Transportation Alternatives for having me on this panel. Um, while I'm getting started, I would love to just see in the chat um, for people who are tuned in, um, what kind of organization you work for, whether you're an advocate or a city staff person or a, a public um, servant practitioner um, or consultant, um, just to have an idea of kind of who we're talking to today. Um, and while you're doing that, and I'll pull up the chat so I can see, um, uh, I'll just go ahead and get started and get the chat all set up here and get organized. So um, yeah, as Philip said, my name is Jenny O'Connell. Um, I am a program manager at NACTO. For those of you who don't know, um, Vignesh just referenced NACTO a lot, but NACTO is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. Um, and we work with about 86 cities and transit agencies across North America to support cities as they build um, their cities and streets as places for people. Um, so this year, the construction barrel and cone and water filled barrier really became very hip um, as cities began to build more and more quick build projects. Um, and those quick build projects took on a new urgency during the time of COVID. Um, we saw these kinds of materials be used to create quick build spaces for essential services like this pop-up project in Atlanta to build sidewalk extensions for queuing like here in DC and all over the country and the world. We saw construction cones be used to create bike lanes and places for walking, like this picture in Brookline, Mass. <laughs> we saw construction materials be used to close off streets. We saw the planters that Will showed earlier being used for the same thing or to slow streets down. We saw water-filled barriers demarcate space for outdoor dining, like here in Somerville, Massachusetts. And we saw all sorts of other materials like these flexible ballers, these uh, flexible delineators be used for quick build traffic circles, like here in Pittsburgh, um, amid a year where there were really low traffic volumes and really high speeds. We saw cities delineate space and create areas for people to vend on the street to, to sell their products and their food, like this market in um, a historically black community in Portland, Oregon. And the really key thing that I'm gonna talk about today is community involvement in these quick build projects. Um, so we heard a lot from Will and from Vignesh about um, some of the logistics of getting this done and some of the materials. Um, and I wanna talk about the value of bringing communities into the, pro into the process when you're doing quick build projects. 
Oftentimes we hear that community involvement creates a hurdle or can create time. I heard Big Nash saying that people push back on things or they don't like them. Um, and we have a history, especially in this country, of really not bringing people into the fold and especially on quick build projects because we do them fast, we're trying to demonstrate something. Um, and bringing community voices into the project, and I'm gonna talk about this today with a couple of examples, really makes projects a lot better and a lot more effective. So this year, NACTO, as one of the things that we did uh, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic, is that we were able to provide grants for a number of quick build projects in 10 cities in our network. Um, so we provided grants to cities that were creating community space on the street. We provided grants to cities that were expanding their streeteries. Um, and we provided grants to cities that were creating information hubs on their streets. Um, and I have Durham in parentheses here because it's not quite what they did, but I'm gonna talk more about what they did. And the key to these grant programs is that the cities that applied and who we awarded funds to had to be doing a project um, in a community that had specifically asked for a project that addressed a community need. And they had to have a community partner already lined up in their city um, who they could work with on this project. Um, and it had to be a community that, that had been particularly hard hit by COVID in one way or another. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Durham project, which I think is a really good example of how bringing community into the process when you're building a quick build project ultimately makes the project significantly better um, and, uh, and can actually speed it along. So Durham set out uh, to build five shared streets in East Durham. And they did this alongside a community partner called Spirit House, which has long-standing ties with this community, um, and specifically with a project manager named Ideal Ortiz, who's the woman you see in the middle of this uh, photo. And she went to the community and she did a couple of different things. She first held for each shared street that they were planning um, a, a design day where she went out and she got ideas from community members and she did a number of interactive activities with community members to get their sense of what they wanted from their shared streets. And then she went back to the community on a second day and she did a co-creative design activity with them. And they learned a lot about these communities and what these communities wanted. And what they found is that the simple sort of act of closing the street wasn't really something that was that appealing to these particular communities. Rather, they really wanted safety improvements on their streets. And it turned out that they'd been asking for safety improvements on their streets for a long time. And there was a lot of historic distrust in the community because the city hadn't been listening to them and hadn't been addressing those concerns. So Ideal and Spirit House really led the community involvement process for the city of Durham. And the result was that they really changed their street design process. So they did implement five shared streets but they also implemented nine traffic safety improvements. They involved over 60 uh, community volunteers in the planning design and implementation process. And they were able to circle back $8,000 into the local economic um, activity in, the, in those neighborhoods using black led businesses and street champions and local nonprofits. And what they created were these amazing designs with um, a local artist and with uh, local residents, like this quick build traffic circle, these curb uh, bulb outs um, like this, um, and this other traffic circle, which is in the background here. And just a couple of um, things that I think were really keys to the success of the project in Durham. Um, you know, I, like I said, they had this years long relationship with Spirit House and with Ideal. Um, the city was willing to change course based on the community input. So they set out to build shared streets and they really changed to creating safety projects. Um, they had flexible contracting that enabled better flow of dollars to local nonprofits and to uh, other black led businesses in the neighborhoods. And they had a, a city commitment to operationalizing equity. And I think that's really key because they didn't just say, we wanna have an equitable process for building projects, but they operationalized that by uh, including Ideal and Spirit House in the project development and planning process for these projects. Um, I'm gonna now talk about Oakland, which is another city that I think did a really interesting job. They're not one of the cities that we provided uh, a grant to, um, but Oakland was one of the first cities to do a big expansion of their, or rather a big rollout of their slow streets program. 
And that was great. And people used the streets and they were really excited. But there was also pushback and warranted pushback from advocates. Um, this is a tweet from Dr. Destiny Thomas, who's talking about this concept of purple lining. And it really highlighted that the city was excited to do something, was reacting really quickly to this issue of the COVID-19 spread. Um, they were trying to create space on the street, but they didn't take a moment to say, hey, what do community members think and what do they actually want and need at this exact moment? So after a couple of months of, uh, of rolling out this program, they did a big survey and they got a ton of survey responses um, to figure out what people felt about the shared, the slow streets program. And overwhelmingly the response was positive, but when they dug into the data and they saw who had responded to the survey, they noticed that there was uh, not much response from East Oakland, which is um, a primarily uh, Latinx community. And so they went to that community and they said, hey, what do you want from your slow streets? Like, are you using this program? How's it going? And the community member said like, mm, that's okay, but like really what we want is, is COVID information or really what we need is safe streets. And again, these were safe streets improvements that they'd been asking for, but not been getting. So it was an opportunity for the city to sort of rethink their project. Um, and they found that, yeah, like it says here on the screen, um, that traffic safety was a more important transportation issues and issue in this community um, than shared streets. And so what they did is they really shifted the focus of their program. So from April to May, they were focused on the slow streets corridor rollout right away. That was right when COVID um, hit. And then in June and July, they were focusing more on essential places and slow streets corridors and priority areas. And we saw a shift in the project focus to creating more of these safety improvements, like these quick build uh, crosswalks, like uh, Vignesh was just talking about and other safety islands like this for folks in Oakland who, we're really asking for, for safe streets improvements. So I wanna just end with a couple of takeaways um, that these are some ways to set yourself up for quick builds that address community needs and concerns. And I saw that there are a lot of um, uh, people who work for public agencies on here. So this is helpful for you guys, but also for some of the advocates on the phone, you know, how to sort of work with the, your local partners. Um, Contracting is a really big barrier for working with local community partners. So this is a, a photo of Mark Woods, who's a local partner who worked with Minneapolis on the uh, implementation of their um, mobility hubs this summer. Um, you know, they had inflexible contracting processes, and so it was difficult for them to be able to get Mark on board and pay him for his ideas rather than just his outputs. Um, and they were able to create a sort of a workaround with their contracting process, but Flexible contracting is really important for paying and working with local partners. And those local partners are really essential for getting community members involved. Um, also uh, making your procurement processes a little bit more flexible. You can see here that this is the project that we funded in Alexandria. They purchased this awning and um, they purchased a couple of years of Wi-Fi um, so that they could provide access for students who needed space outside to do outdoor learning. Um, but the procurement processes for all of these cities were really challenging and they created major hurdles. You know, they had to go through a, a competitive process, even for really small contracts. Um, and that prevented them from being able to purchase things quickly and implement and, and build fast. So all of those materials that Vignesh was just showing, some of those are subject to procurement processes that take a long time. And having better flexibility or more flexibility in the contracting and the, pro the procurement processes is really important. Um, relationship building, like here in Portland, was also super important. And this is long-term relationship building with community members and community partners. So long before projects begin, as projects are happening, and then after they're complete, so that the trust and the relationships are built and grow over time. And we saw the same thing really in all the cities, but this is another good example of uh, relationship building in Durham. Oh, sorry, sorry, Detroit. Um, and then the division of responsibilities is also really important between the cities and local partners. So like this project here in New York City and in Rockways, um, there was complete division of responsibility between New York City DOT that sort of stepped back and, and did a lot of the kind of uh, navigating of the city systems, doing a lot of the design work on the streets, 
Um, and then leaving the programming of the space that they created to Rise, um, which is the local partner who they worked with for this space. So these are uh, Rise staff here at the table working with uh, a woman who lives in this community. So they left the programming to the local partner, which is embedded in the community and understands the community and the community's needs. And they really got some of the logistics out of the way um, on the back end. And same thing here in Atlanta. Atlanta created the space on the street, but they really left the programming to Georgia Stand Up and to the Trans Transformation Alliance in um, Atlanta so that they could work with community members and get the programming done. And ultimately, what this is all coming down to is dismantling the status quo. We really saw red tape go away this year, and we saw it disappear. Like in April and May, it was gone. And by June and July, a lot of that red tape came back. But dismantling the status quo and relying on these old sort of outdated procurement and contracting processes is not going to serve us well as we shift to doing more quick build rapid response projects that really address community needs. Um, and you can see that this is a completely open road in Toronto. Um, and, and I think this is a really nice before after picture from some work that our global team did in Fortaleza. You know, they took this space um, and they said, this isn't working for us anymore. And they created a, a completely amazing pop-up um, quick build project in, in temporary materials. Um, and so I just will leave us with this, that you know the, the quick build is possible um, and we can do it. And I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. Um, for the audience uh, at home, please feel free to your questions um, down below on the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them um, as quickly as possible and to as many questions as possible. Um, so the first question um, will, just bridging from uh, Jenny's presentation back to yours, um, a lot of Americans are thinking, how did London do it? How did you implement over 100 kilometers so quickly? Was the community involved uh, or was this seen as an emergency power the city should take advantage of during the crisis? So the 100 kilometers in, in, in 12 months was uh, under emergency powers. This was actually done by government, uh, central government. So it was the equivalent of the federal government saying um, this is something that needs to happen. What was interesting, though, although every city got that, you know, had the same power and actually had quite a lot of the funding, I come back to the uh, to the point that actually to, to be able to deliver it, no one ever, no one else achieved that that pace of change and that scale of change under those emergency measures. And I think that is down to having the experience, you know, the experience of of people like Jenny who can do do that work with communities, and the people like Vignesh who've got that skills to be able to de deliver that rapidly, and to be able to think very creatively and in innovate very fast to to be to be able to do that. So. While this year it was um, very much uh, down to emergency powers, the past four years, you know, we delivered 200 and something kilometers of, of, of cycle lane. And, you know, I, you know I, can wrote, I could list off all the achievements that the mayor's done, but I won't because it's not a political meeting. Um, but that, I think, is much more down to that community engagement, uh, the desire. There was a question in the chat, what comes first? The cyclists or the safe cycle lane and in my view it is the safe cycle lane it, when you build it people come that awful film with kevin costner from the 80s is absolutely right you know build it and they will come when you put in safe infrastructure people start cycling and not just the guys with um you know the young hipsters uh with the, with with their fancy bikes we're talking about normal people older people younger people women men, uh, people from all different ethnic backgrounds, when you build it, they come. And I think that's a, sort of the, the adage that I've, I've really seen this happen in London. Great, thank you for that. Um, I think this is going to be a question more for um, Jenny and Vignesh, um, based either on local government demands or standards or appropriate local context. How much variety is there on the type of materials used for quick build projects? Or are most quick build materials universal from jurisdicts from city to city? I, I can start answering this, this question. Um, there, there's, there's not a consistency. There is not. Um, there's, what we do is we write the specs and we specify what 
I would like or what the engineers would like from the engineering perspective. So I can specify, I like this post with this many square inches of retroflectivity that meets white between these two hue colors and mounts between this certain way. And then the contractor goes, figures out a post that meets my spec criteria. Now I might secretly have a specific post that I have in mind that I like using, but I still specify that in the contract because of design, bid, build. I'm not allowed to work with a contractor and be like, hey, bro, or hey, whoever, you know, you, you get this for cheap, or this is something you can call, contact here, or there's a contractor, there's a, there's a provider here that's going to work with you, and then I'll put that into the plans, and we all got, we all, we're not supposed to do that, right? And so there isn't actually any consistency. Now, what we do, we do have is we have um, uh, uh, certain things that engineers may already use, like so there are certain types of posts that we use in our highway system that they're already comfortable with, and we may want to use that on the roadway. It may not look as nice, and so I put an example of the the raised marker with the with the bump on the bottom because engineers are already comfortable with that, but there is not uh, a lot of consistency. Um, with curb and gutter, curb and gutter is six inches. You no, know, got a two one and a half foot one and a half to two foot gutter pan. There may be a, a little bit of flexibility in the batter of the of the of the curb, like it may have a little bit more of a slope back and forth. And there's some differences between different cities on that regarding trash pickup. Uh, snow plows, et cetera, but there isn't really, I wouldn't say a lot of consistency. Now to the, the second part of your question about uh, um, cities doing, doing this is, is I would recommend that if you, on your county level on a public health perspective or on their transit agencies level on a, on a overreaching for over multiple cities is getting some consistency in your post for comfort for your community. Um, in San Jose, we put in the case and one post, the big green ones with the big reflectivity. And we did that quickly in San Jose. And then from that, we've seen a lot of other cities in the local area in the county and also in the greater Bay Area, Oakland and, and San Francisco copying the post that we used in San Jose because we were the first ones to implement it that way. And so because they were like, oh, our community members already know San Jose, they recognize those facilities, they know how they work, they're comfortable in those facilities. Let's use that same product here in our city because that way we give consistency for the greater region. And so we've seen a lot of that and people be like, oh, I've seen this before. I saw this in San Jose. Now I'm happy that's in Oakland now, you know? And so that gives a, le a level of comfort for your community and your leaders. But in terms of an engineering perspective, there's only the spec requirements of about like reflectivity, color, resistance to being hit, um, wear and tear, um, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I would also just add that I think, um... You know the materials vary from from like duration of project. So some of these like you know demonstration projects that are meant to be up for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you, know, you can use like straw filled tubes, um, and those are just as effective at kind of creating a, a change in the shape of the street as concrete in some ways. Um, but obviously they don't last for a long time. I mean I think like you know I made a joke about the construction barrels becoming hip this year but I, I remember that at the beginning of the year there was a lot of resistance to using that kind of material uh, for quick build projects because it wasn't done before um, but that was what was available to the cities because that's what their their departments of public works usually had um, and so I think we saw a big uptick in the use of those kinds of materials and so I think like you know to the to the point of really like dismantling how things are currently done you know, being flexible with what kinds of materials you're willing to use, um, especially if the projects are, you know, going to be there for only a couple of months, um, or you know, you're planning to build them out later, is is really important to being able to get them done quickly. Great, thank you both for that. Uh, circling back to Will, a uh, question from the audience: um, What are some of the ways? that London has identified places that could use a quick build bike lane? Is it data-driven, advocacy-driven, or driven by building connections between lane networks? So um, we have been using a data-driven approach. We did a, a big piece of analysis on where should we be building strategically our cycle network. Um, it's available online. I put a link in the chat. Um, but for the emergency and temporary uh, uh, lines, we actually redid the analysis because there were slightly different reasons for why people might want to use them. So, for example, if people weren't using the public transit system or were reluctant to use the public transit system because of COVID, 
could we get a bike lane to sort of to mimic that uh, that 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 train line or that bus network? Um, and so we redid the analysis as a temp as using temporary for temporary bike lanes. I also put that link in in the uh, in the um, in the in the in the in the chat. Um, but obviously, a bike journey isn't just about route you need somewhere to park it and you, at, at either end you need bike storage and so that's also been part of the plan uh, we have again a data-driven strategy on supply and demand uh, for that uh, but again we had to sort of up, update that with the with the COVID crisis because what we found was that a lot of the medical staff working in hospitals suddenly switched to cycling and they were obviously key workers so we provided more bikes we provided more higher bikes Around, uh, uh, bike parking, sorry, and more higher bikes around the hospitals, which came some became some of the busiest um, busiest stations, uh, bike stations during during the uh, during the crisis. We also gave all our doctors and nurses free trips on our bikes, so they didn't have to pay for anything. Great, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> a very specific question for Jenny. Um, there's someone who was really excited about the grant program and wants to know, you know, who, who can apply and how does that work, um, either for quick builds or in general. Yeah, so that was our first foray into uh, grant making. We we're hoping to do more in the future, but uh, nothing, nothing uh, concretely lined up as of yet. But we do announce things like that via our newsletter. Um, I'm not sure who asked if it's an ACTO member. Um, but, you know, we announce things like that via our newsletter. I'm happy to follow up by email um, if you have a specific question. Yeah, I guess that's an important point. First, make sure <laughs> your city is an ACTO member. Um, you know, anyone who's been watching these panels today knows that it's been mentioned um, by every single panelist on every panel. So, um, Vignesh, this is a question for you. Um, you mentioned um, managing water a lot during your presentation. In my experience, bike lane projects cost bike lane projects costs skyrocket when gutters, drains, and other water management design elements are included. And when they're not, you often see water puddles at the curb, especially with quick builds, since they are often temporary. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's a tough problem, you know. And we see a lot of these the water puddles in the curb. That sounds like an existing problem, you know. That that sounds like an existing issue for that community that there's already ponding issues in that community. Typically we see that in minority low income communities because they have less clout, they have less push than some of the more affluent communities where they have street sweeping or other types of programmatic things uh, to, to help keep the road water, keep, uh, keep the water from ponding. Um, but it, it, is, it, is, it, is a big, it is a big problem. I would not recommend doing a quick build project if there is an existing ponding issue. That's how you break your community because your community is very aware of the uh, issues. We've seen that in Oakland and uh, a lot of other areas where they go and do these kind of projects and then the community's like, what, you took away my parking and you didn't fix the street? And like, you put in the bike lane, that's not for me, right? And so there's, we've seen a lot of that uh, um, come up. <clears throat> so I recommend that you do, uh, 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 you either do a corner pilot project that maybe is leading to a swale. Let's say, hey, we're doing this pilot project here and we're gonna use it to help do a swale project. Maybe you implement some swales early on as part of the, the first phase, or you, that's, what, that's what you convince everybody that that's what you're doing in your implementation. But this is a big problem when we talk about bike lanes, especially through low-income forgotten communities, because we're, we're starting to, we're, cities finally get around to be like, okay, we got money to go pave the streets. And they go like, and this is an example in Oakland, they go start to pave the streets and they realize, oh wait, our whole neighborhood does not have drainage. And we're trying to pave streets for class three bike lanes. And we're just putting a patch on top of the actual problem, you know? And so, um, yeah, water is very important. That's why I talked about in the beginning and throughout the presentation is because I don't want quick build to be used as a way to put a patch on our actual water public health issues. Um, and that's why I talk about water being the whole fundamental of how our cities exist from day one. And we can't be ignoring that for the sake of quick build. And so, um, yeah, that's why I, 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 I brought that up. Um, but I'd say in cities that already have a good managed water, like San Jose manages the water very well. Um, I was part of the NACTO grant program. It's a very great program. Um, we, the whole Better Bikeways project was part of NACTO. And so that project was a great success there because San Jose already manages their water well. They paved the streets. Their streets are already very, have a very high pavement condition index in the Bay Area. And so it worked really well in that city. Whereas in other cities that already have a lot of these public health 
city staff, city organization, DOT, public works, arguing with each other kind of issues, then um, you have to solve those issues before you start doing fancy quick build stuff. And uh, a city like Oakland is one of those cities where they have like public works and DOT are competing. For, and it's not that in most cities, public works, DOT, environmental, parks and rec, all build curb and gutter. They all hire their own consultants. They all have their own funds and they have competing interests in the same corner, you know? And we have to make sure they all work together before we start doing paint and post and fancy art and stuff like that. Great, thank you. Um, this question is both uh, for me and Will. Um, Will, you mentioned in your presentation that um, sometimes uh, it's more appropriate to do temporary infrastructure projects. Um, and then also um, maybe for Jenny or for both as well, um, when do you make the decision to um, convert a temporary uh, quick build project into a permanent project? Jenny, do you want to go first on that? No, I think you'll have a better answer. I doubt it, but um, I, you know, we've been doing stuff. We have a, a the way that it works here is we've got a, a limit on how long the things can can last for. So it's eighteen months, uh, and uh, we are looking at all of them as trials. They're you know just to call them temporary is is not right. They are trials because we are changing and responding to feedback. We're we're tracking, we're monitoring the number of people using them. The problems, you know, if there's an issue for a loading bay or maybe some of the drainage issues Vignesh talked about, um, you know, this, a lot of them are getting tweaked and changed over, over time. But we need to make a decision um, uh, after uh, within 18 months. That decision isn't just for me or the mayor or any of the city officials to make. That is where we engage the communities um, and sort of, you know, and, and they've been part of this experiment. They've been part of the trial. They've been part of providing the feedback. And so there is a consultation process to go through on what people want to see as permanent and what changes they want to make on the scheme. You know, does it, does it need to be improved? And I, I don't think all of them will stay. Uh, some of them don't, I think probably won't need to stay, but some of them will. And what we're finding is that very often one community has something that they're a low traffic neighborhood and the neighboring community are going, well, it's not fair. Why have those guys over there got this? Why can their kids skateboard in the street? Why can their kids walk safely to school without having the danger of being hit by a car? That's not fair. We, we, we want that. So one of the problems we've got now is not trying to, uh, is trying to keep up with the demand as well as shift from temporary to permanent. It's a nice problem to have, but it is a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think like there's a lot of different reasons or a lot of different point decision points at which you might go from temporary to permanent or temporary to not there anymore. Um, and I think, you know, some of it might be related to materials wear down and it's you're sort of at an inflection point. Some of it has to do with, um, you know, using a temporary or a quick build project to um, make a data case for making a more permanent change. Um, and so it's sort of a matter of when you're able to collect that data and make the case for a more permanent change. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's like Will is saying, kind of related to community input and, and pressure. A lot of times when a project is really good and people really like it, they are super vocal about it. And I think that that's part of the value of having communities involved from, from the get go is that going and saying, you know, hey, have you liked this thing that we put in, as opposed to saying, all right, let's build this thing together, let's work on whether it's good, is it working, is it not working, should we change it, um, is really important because it helps you, that whole process is a lot smoother and the project is a lot better when you're able to have that kind of back and forth. Great, thank you. Uh, we only have a couple more minutes, so um, I'll try to get through these really quick. Um, so just be mindful with the answer, um, with shorter answers. So Vignesh, to avoid um, cutting corners to save costs, where are the opportunities for cutting costs that cities aren't taking advantage of when it comes to quick builds? Are there any? Um, we're cutting costs, yes. Um, paving projects is the best thing. Um, City of San Jose was implements $34 million of paving projects every year. Our quick build project of six 
15 miles of protected bike lane only costed $1.4 million in addition to the $34 million they were already going to spend anyway, you know? And so they do, so this is just, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a small in comparison um, and with big impact. And so that's a big thing that cities miss is the city <clears throat> does not do their homework for their own paving project. What I mean by that is the city will write into the contracting spec telling the contractor to put back the paint in kind. And in the spec, the contractor is responsible to go out to the field, find the existing worn out markings, where, 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 figure out where they are and put it back in kind. And this is a way for the city to not have to design the road when they do paving projects. It's just a way of kind of skating by. They have the opportunity to pave a bunch of streets and do something different, but they choose not to. And they just write in the spec and be like, hey, go out there, pave it back, put back what you find, call it a day, right? And so this is a great opportunity, a huge opportunity that's missed all the time with all these cities because they pay so many every every year and they don't have, they're not able to go do their homework of preparing a plan set to do that. Now, why aren't they prepared, able to prepare a plan set is because they don't have standard details for these type of facilities. They don't even understand how they work. They don't understand how people are going to use them. So having a big project that goes into a capital improvement project and then the city start thinking about like, okay, we have to CIP this and more. And so going in and, and setting up a bunch of standard details for your city staff from the very beginning and then implementing those standard details at a corner or something during the paving projects is probably one of the best, most cost-effective ways of doing it. So many cities, they, they, they do a big like planning level design guideline. Like, you know, you know what I'm talking about, these pretty books that say, this is our city and this is our design guideline. This is what a protected bike lane is. This is what a bike trail is. This is what that. But all those are is the consultants copy paste that from every other city and they give you pretty pictures with the city's colors and they resend that to the city. What I think we cities should be doing is they should be using that effort of the uh, uh, of the bicycle design guideline facilities palette to develop engineering standard details that are already agreed on by the city staff that's implementing paving projects. Then you have a bunch of standard details with the city's loader and logo and border with the city managers or city engineers stamp on the standard details. And then you don't have to go through any approval. You don't have to go through capital improvement projects or a big project to go, any, you don't have to do anything to go implement that. You just have to send the maintenance crew to go out and put it down. Great. Yeah, so can, can, I, can I come up on that just quickly in terms of cost Absolutely. saving? Um, one of the things that we've learned, and it, it might be different in the US, but uh, certainly we have, you know, we don't just have an issue of water under our, our, our streets. We've got our electricity, we've got our gas, we've got our, um, we've got our mm -hmm. fiber optic broadband. We've got an underground system. You, God, in one one of the cycle lanes, we found a whole load of unexploded World War II bombs. Um, you know, so but one of the key things that has actually saved quite a lot of money and most importantly time um, is actually getting everybody to work together. So actually beginning to coordinate the utilities work, saying, well, if you guys have got some replacement work in terms of water coming up, and if you guys got some stuff that you need to do on. Um, on the electricity, well, let's try and combine that. And what we do in the in here is we charge the utility companies by the day for how long they dig up our streets. So there's a lane rental charge. If if they, mm. which does two things, it encourages people to work together because they can split that cost, yeah? But it also means that they're much quicker at digging up the roads and replacing things. And that then, that money, is ring fenced for invest for innovations. That's how we come up with the new materials. That's how we come up with the new processes or new signals technologies or that sort of thing. Um, we have to pay the, that money ourselves. You know, our guys pay that cost, which encourages our teams. It's an internal budget to encourage that. And we've just expanded that to pavement. So uh, because often what we found is that they were using the sidewalks to uh, to save money on the lane rentals and that in, makes it dangerous for pedestrians to walk around so now they'll have to rent you know we have a, a a sidewalk rental scheme again that money goes back into an innovation pot but the most important thing is it encourages people to cooperate and it also uh, saves time in terms of uh, contractors building because they they're literally paying by the day Great, thank you so much um, for that, Will. Um, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Um, if so if you'd like to learn more about this topic, please feel free to join us tomorrow on a session titled Advocating for Quick Builds. Uh, thank you again to the panelists for your time and expertise on the topic. I personally learned a lot. 
Uh, and thank you to the audience for joining and asking such great questions. Um, that's it for today. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Philip. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all. This was great. Thank you. I appreciate it and good questions.